Welcome to the Stepping Stones Project. Today, September 14th, 2014. Today we're going to be talking about Isaiah's chapter 6 and 7 and what I've titled The Call of Isaiah. As we looked at our overview, we have this uh, three breakout part that I mentioned previously for Isaiah. Uh, this is taken from the ESV Study Bible. The, the first major block is where I've said you are here, and this is Isaiah 1 through 39. So the key component that's happening here is the Assyrian threat. <clears throat> the Assyrian threat has to do with the fact that, as we're going to see next week, talk about it in more detail, the northern region of Israel, uh, which has broken away from the southern region, which is called Judah, uh, is threatening Judah with military force if they don't come and uh, join them. And uh, the, the king at the time, King Ahaz, is responding that in a way that's not very helpful. He's going to ally himself with the larger nation, Assyria, on an attempt to defend himself against the northern kingdom of Israel. So as we see what's happening here, uh, this is in the 700 BC. The next major block will be in the 500s. And then we'll see, of course, some end time prophecy coming after that. I've shown this map before. This is the uh, Hittites uh, in the north and uh, Aram, some of the other major nations that are there. <clears throat> they are all being taken over by Assyria. As Assyria is coming around counterclockwise around the region, uh, this is what down in little brown spot down there in Judah, you see the city of Jerusalem. Uh, this is what they see coming. And this is the, uh, the part where you, you see this tide washing down and they're trying to decide, will they fight the Assyrians or will they ally with the Assyrians? In particular, since Samaria, just to the north of them, uh, is providing a threat to them, the King Ahaz's approach is going to be to ally himself with this uh, area to the north, the Assyrians. <clears throat> so this week we continue our study of Isaiah. This is really, in my opinion, the start of the vision of Isaiah. And up until now, the first five chapters have really been just introductory prophecies. So we will start with the call of Isaiah, starting with chapter six, starting at verse one. So in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. Many of you may have sung those or similar words in some of our hymns. We sung some of those this morning. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Just as a comment, uh, this is one of those interesting parts of Hebrew. Uh, as with every language, you use idioms to mean other things at times. And so uh, it's not totally clear, but it's often uh, when you see a reference like this. In this case, you see <coughs> the seraphim uh, covering his wings with his wings areas for humility. So his face is being covered for humility. You might wonder why is he covering his feet? And the answer is, is that the, in Hebrew, when you say feet, often you mean a man's uh, private area. And that's probably what he's actually covering here. So with two, he flew and one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. It's a common hymn again. So as we talk about the quotable Isaiah, you may have sung these or similar words in one of the hymns that you've sung. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. Now you have to understand, he's, you know, Isaiah has gone into the temple probably to do work. I mean, try to imagine, if you will, that you worked at a church. Maybe you have a series of ministries. Somebody cuts the grass. Somebody else handles this. Somebody needs to vacuum the sanctuary. Imagine that you're on the vacuuming committee. You have gone into the sanctuary to vacuum. And God shows up. That is what may have happened here to Isaiah. We get the idea that he was in the temple, probably doing regular priestly work. And as he showed up, suddenly God shows up and things change. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. So when Isaiah first has this experience of being in the presence of the Lord, he sees himself. And his first reaction to that is he sees those parts of himself that are not pleasing to God. 
He understands that he has spoken things. We don't know what. Maybe it was gossip. Maybe it was criticism. Maybe it was unkind words. Who knows? But whatever it was, he says that he is, and I quote, a man of unclean lips. How about you? Are you a man or woman of unclean lips? Are there times when you speak things that you know are not encouragement? Do you speak life into those who are around you? Or do you speak things that cut, that criticize, that tear down? Do you speak life or do you speak death? What do you speak into the lives of those around you? Words matter. And Isaiah recognizes this. I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. But that part is burned away by the coal. Continuing in verse 8, And I hear the verse, voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? The Lord wants someone to carry his message, to use their lips to speak the prophecies that will come, to explain to the people what it is that the Lord wants. He needs someone to step up. The same is true in our time. Someone needs to speak. Yes, I'm a pastor. Yes, you're listening to me. Yes, I'm called to do this. But you are too. Okay, not preach, and I understand that. But you are called to speak about Jesus Christ. You are called to be able to express why he is important to you. God didn't save you, if you are saved, so that you could sit and wait for the end times. Your death or the time when he would come. God saved you so you could do work, so you could be his hand, his feet, and yes, his mouth, that you could speak life into those around you. Someone near you needs to hear about Jesus, and no offense, if you don't do it, it's possible no one else will. The Lord is saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. The sarcasm here is rich. This is what is happening, is the people of Israel have become so regimented in their religion that even though they'll go and hear the word of the Lord at the temple, it doesn't mean a thing. They go to church, so to speak, on Sunday. Now that's Saturday for them, but work with me. They go to church on Sunday morning. They hear all the words. They sing all the songs. And they just go home and nothing is changed. That is not what God wants. In fact, he gets so frustrated with it. If you go back and reread the first couple chapters of Isaiah, you might hear him where he said, Look, I'm tired of this trampling of my courts. Just stop. Just stop doing church. Just stop. That's pretty powerful. Jesus will later refer to this when you, of course, the people come to him and they ask him, why does he speak in parables? This is his answer. His answer is that the people of Israel still keep on hearing but do not understand. He was referring back to Isaiah 6. Verse 10, make the heart of the people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts, turn and be healed. Isaiah is grieved by this message. He was hoping it was going to be a, a message of encouragement. Instead, there apparently is discipline coming and he's the one to carry the load. And so he answers, then I said, how long, O Lord? And he, that's God, said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste and the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are in the midst of the land God is forecasting what will happen when the Assyrians and later the Babylonians come over top of the nation take people into captivity burn the cities and remove the people out so that they can go into a time of purification which is what they need and though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. We'll see this again when we get to the stump of Jesse that's coming next week. <clears throat> Going to verse 7. 
And in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. These are the northern kings, as I mentioned, and the related areas around there. The nation of Israel has split into two pieces, the northern kingdom and southern kingdom. We're currently tracking with Ahaz, who's the king of the southern kingdom, known as Judah. And the king of the southern, uh, of the northern kingdom, rather, is going to come down and wage war along with the others who are around there. They're going to wage war against Jerusalem, but they can't yet attack it. They're not strong enough. They're in the fields around, but they're not actually able to lay siege to the city, which, by the way, is in a very defensible spot up on a hill. Verse 2, when the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim. So this is saying your enemies are gathering against you. The heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. So he's hearing that, oh my gosh, that I have multiple enemies to the north. What shall I do? Verse 3, And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shir Jazab, your son. That name, Shir Jazab, means, And a remnant shall return. By Isaiah naming his son that, it's a prophecy that, yes, we will take it into captivity, but there will be a remnant that will be returned. So go out and meet him at the end of the conduit of Everpool on the highway to the washer's field, and say to him, be careful, be quiet, do not fear. Do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the sons of Remaliah, because Syria with Ephraim and the sons of Remaliah has devised evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrify it. Let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabeel as the son in the midst of it. Thus sends the Lord God, it shall not stand and it shall not come to pass. He goes on to explain for the head of Syria is Damascus, the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramah. If you are not firm in your faith, you will not be firm at all. If you're not going to write anything else down from today's sermon, please write that down. Isaiah chapter 7, 9b. If you're not firm in your faith, you will not be firm at all. Guys, this absolutely deals with us here in 2014. If you are not firm in your faith, you will not be firm at all. Verse 10, and again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask for a sign of the Lord your God. This is God telling him. God says, ask me for a sign. Ask for a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol. That's the underworld or world kind of like hell. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, oh, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Like, oh, I'm so pious. I wouldn't dare. God just told him to do this. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. Don't want to bother you. Don't want to bother you. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, and this is one you might know. Isaiah 7:14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and we shall call his name Emmanuel, which, if you don't know, means God with us. The L on the end, Emmanuel, the L on the end is the root stem for God. Okay, you might know El Shaddai is one of the names of God. So El is one of the, the forms of God in Hebrew. Emmanuel is God with us. So, Let's talk about what this means here. So they're in a very specific place. This is, a, this is well dated. We know exactly when this happened. Isaiah is looking at him and saying, you, you need to ask for a sign so God can convince you you don't need to worry about the northern kingdom of Israel. And Ahaz is like, oh, no, 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 not going to bother God, not going to do it. Fine, God will give you a sign anyway. Therefore, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. You shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. Common things for a young child. And so how old would a three to five, or how old would it be when he can refuse the evil and choose the good? Mm, three to five years old, something like that. We'll say by five years old. So before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land 
whose two kings you dread will be deserted. Translated, within five years, your perceived problem won't even exist anymore. Okay, so if you go back to Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. You're probably thinking, hey, wait, that's Christmas. That's Jesus. It is. And this is a key concept here for prophecy. A key thing for you to write down is, it's very common that we get what's called double fulfillment. Double fulfillment means that you have a near time fulfillment of the prophecy and a far time the near time is there is a alma. What's an alma? What's that word virgin? Alma can mean a woman who has not yet had relations with a man, or alma can mean a young lady. So in the near time prophecy, a reasonable interpretation would be there will be a young woman who perhaps as of this moment has not yet had relations with a man, or perhaps just a young lady. Either way, it doesn't really matter. She will have relations with a man. This is not immaculate conception. She will have a child. It will be a boy. She will name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And by the time that he's able to choose the evil and the good, evil from good, um, she will be able to say that lo and behold, um, that the northern kingdom has been destroyed, no longer exists before you can choose the good over the evil, I meant to say. So that is the near time prophecy, the near time effect. The far time is what will happen approximately 700 years after this date when a virgin, Mary, and the Gospels are excruciatingly clear at that point, particularly Luke, that that interpretation is not a young woman, but a woman who has not had relations with a man. That woman, Mary, will bear a son, and his name, Emmanuel, his common name, will be Yeshua, or as we would say it, Jesus. Okay? So that interpretation is the far time prophecy that will come from this. If you have any Jewish friends, they will gladly agree with you that this prophecy for Ahaz was about a young child that would occur in 700 BC. They would likely strongly disagree with you that there is a second fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. This is where our uh, parent religion and our religion split, one of several. But this is an example of one where we, go, we part and go different ways. Let me go ahead and give you a couple of takeaways I'd like for you to know. Number one, God shows up when you least expect it. You're in there vacuuming the sanctuary and God shows up. You are busy doing other things. Great quote. Life happens when you're busy doing other things. John Lennon. So you are busy doing other things. God shows up. This has happened to me multiple times in my life, and I pray it happens to you as well. It's kind of cool. When you least expect it, God shows up, number one. Number two, he asks the most profound questions if we are willing to listen. When Isaiah is there, he declares his sin and is forgiven his sin. He is then in awe and is listening. And God asks a question, who will go for us? Who? Who will go? His solutions are not our solutions. They are better than that. Isaiah says, send me. And God gives him the message. What was Isaiah hoping for? Hey guys, it's all peachy keen. You'll be delivered from your enemies and everything's going to be just fine. That is in fact not the message. The message is they will be conquered, they will go into captivity, and it will happen. Now, ironically, Ahaz is going to take steps in an attempt to try and prevent exactly that from happening, and all he will do is make it worse and it will happen 200 years later. We'll get into that next week. But just so you're aware of this, God's solutions are not our solutions. They're better than that. Ahaz's solution is an unholy alliance. God's solution was, trust me. And number four, his solutions don't just fix the problem. They fix us and they make us better. I hope you're writing this down. His solutions don't just fix the problem. They fix us and make us better. And that's why God's God and we are not. Let's go to the question of the week. What does God's solution to my problem look like? Am I willing to let him do it? What does God's solution to my problem look like? 
and am I willing to let him do it? You have a problem. I'm sure. You have multiple problems. So do I. You have a way of fixing your problem. I'd like for you to pause, maybe in just a second when we pray, and think very hard about what God's solution to your problem would look like and how is it different than your solution because I promise his is better than yours let's go to the Lord in prayer Lord Heavenly Father I thank you that you are there to solve our problems and not in the way that we think they need to be solved Lord you surprise us so often surprise us this week by giving us options we didn't even know we had. Don't just fix our problems, God, but please come and fix us. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.